I think those are all Jesus approved things, right? Like I do feel like they (laughs) came from my relationship with God, but they also can get in the way of my relationship with God. So I just think the ego is so tricky. Like it's so tricky. Um, Mm -hmm. I just think I find, I love that too, just placing it all on the altar and just saying, hey, here's my life. You can have it, right? Mm -hmm. And I trust you to give back to me whatever thing I need in the right time in the right place. Like I'm not going to worry and obsess about any of this because I think you got it and everything's unfolding like it should. Hola, it's 2021. Let's start healing. I'm Adrienne Murchison and welcome to episode 54 of the Let's Start Healing podcast. We have more in common than we think and what we have in common can change the world. My guest today is going to speak very much to that. As always, I'm very excited about my guest. This one is a spiritual sister. We both study A Course in Miracles, and uh, she is going to share some of her insight around her spiritual walk with A Course in Miracles. She is in recovery, and she will share a little about that. And 2020 was especially hard for her. And she'll go into that. Her name is Carrie. I'm not going to tell you a great deal about her to protect her anonymity in terms of her recovery. But she is a counselor and she'll just speak to so many things. And I really enjoy talking to Carrie always because we are similar in many ways in terms of our spiritual process, I guess, in terms of how God and different things resonate for us. We have a lot of simpatico. So I'm always interested in and engrossed in what she talks about. We've been in our Course in Miracles uh, study group together. And when she starts talking, it'll be so much what I'm thinking. But then she just crystallizes it for me uh, when she's speaking from her experience. It just really brings it home for me. So I really appreciate Carrie being here. We're going to talk about A Course in Miracles a little bit today, and I'll be discussing A Course in Miracles even more as we move into 2021. But we are going to focus on, in part of our conversation, a paragraph in the book that we both find so beautiful. And so we'll discuss that. And Carrie has also offered a meditation for this podcast. And when we were actually recording, we did a five minute meditation and she shared a beautiful prayer that led us into this five minute meditation for the broadcast. However, I narrowed it down. I shortened it a little bit because I didn't want you to go away if you're not comfortable with meditating or you're not comfortable with silence for more than a short period of time. I shortened our meditation to about 50 seconds. So there'll be later on in the podcast, there'll be about 50 seconds of silence. But I think you will definitely feel the power and the impact of the prayer that leads up to it. And then as we come out of it, I also want to mention that since we launched in 2019, Let's Start Healing has published episodes that are very powerful Some of our most recent episodes was episode 53, where I'm talking with Charles Gilbert about his spiritual journey. I'm going to have a bonus episode from that conversation very shortly. Also, episode 52 was a conversation with Rhoda Carty, where uh, we're talking about tools that can help people who are dealing with sadness and depression. We've had three parts to our Ready in Real segment where black men were discussing how they navigated 2020 with everything that took place. So much we talked about in 2020 on Let's Start Healing. And we will just continue with the powerful conversations in 2021 as we affirm that this 
is going to be a year of healing, a year of healing from COVID and whatever wants to come after COVID can just turn around because we're not having that in 2021. We're embracing the love and power of God. And for those who don't embrace the love and power of God, that's okay. Because those of us who do, we have a love that's so powerful. It incorporates everyone. It incorporates everyone. So 2021 is all about love and healing. And I want to remind you that you can listen to the podcast on traditional podcast platforms, whatever platform you listen on, be sure to subscribe. And also feel free to send me an email. Let me know what you think about Let's Start Healing at Let's Start Healing Podcast at gmail.com. So let's meet Carrie. Let's get started. And let's start healing. Carrie, welcome to Let's Start Healing. I'm super excited. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I feel so connected to you. We talk about that from time to time. You say things that I'm feeling and thinking, and it just raises me to an even higher level because so often in our spiritual discussions, you'll say something and it'll crystallize exactly Mm -hmm. what I'm feeling and thinking. So I know that this year has been um, hard for all of us, I think, on planet Earth. And I wonder if you would please share what your experience uh, has been like. I know you experienced the loss of your mom. And I think about that sometimes, the timing of it and attending her wake. And so how has it been for you? What has this been like when you put things in perspective? Yeah, you know, I do think it has been a hard year for a lot of people. And it's interesting. My mom passed um, literally the week before we went on shutdown in March. So I was really grateful we were able to have a funeral. No one got sick from the funeral to our Mm -hmm. knowledge. But it was like right before kind of COVID became the worldwide pandemic that it is. So you know, my mom had had health issues for a really long time. So her death was not a surprise. But something that's been interesting for me, it's like I had a lot of anticipatory grief. And that has not saved me from the grief process that's been occurring over the past, you know, six, nine months. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the loss of a parent is super significant. And honestly, the stay at home was a gift for me just because with grief, you kind of crawl into a cave anyway, at least I did. (laughs) Like I needed just to be alone. And, you know, I have my husband and a few close friends, but I mean, just having space to cry and journal and do yoga and do whatever I needed to do in the midst of, you know, I kept seeing clients and doing work, which for me is very grounding. Um, I took a little bit of time off, but it's like, I feel like around June, I came out of the cave and I was like, oh my God, COVID pandemic. What? I feel like I would have been by myself a lot anyway, you know, even if there hadn't been a pandemic. So like, I don't know. It's, I think I've been on, you know, an emotional roller coaster with the grief. And then even just with the stay at home order, like I said, the first half of it, I really enjoyed. And then like around July, I was just sick of it. And like, I feel like I've gone through different stages with it. And it's interesting because I have a couple close friends in California. And as you know, they've been a lot more strict with the protocols around COVID. And like, to me, that's kind of what we should be doing. Like, right. So it's just been interesting to contrast some of the freedoms and things that we enjoy here. And like, I've really been thinking, I'm really into astrology. And, you know, a lot of the astrologers are talking about the coming of the Aquarian age, where mm-hmm. we're moving out of this individualistic paradigm and moving into this collective dimension, Mm -hmm. which for the United States is a country where like we pride ourselves on individualism and personal freedom. Mm -hmm. I think it's COVID has really brought all that stuff to the light with people 
wanting to choose what works for them because they have good health or whatever. And it's just like, I think it's forced us into this collective conversation where with friends and family, it's just had to be like, who have you been with? Where have you been? Like anytime I have contact right. with people, um, you kind of have to ask kind of awkward questions <laughs> and like <laughs> make decisions on whether or not you feel comfortable spending in-person time with them, you know, depending on the decisions they've made because their decisions no longer just impact them. Right. Um, so like, I feel like that paradigm shifting has been uncomfortable for me at times. Um, and I, I mean, I don't want to get political at all, but it's like, it's just been very interesting to see people's reactions to it. And even for me with, I have a lifelong history of anxiety. It's like, interesting to see how my anxiety has like grabbed hold of the pandemic and like yeah you know so it's like all my stuff has come up like everyone else's and like covid's been like the name of the game but i think it's just bringing the darkness to light right right i've been thinking a lot about uh you know how some people if you watch the news are just in complete denial about the disease i think that that's a lot of fear I think that the fear is so great that I'm not even going to see this mm-hmm. as, a, as a disease because otherwise, or, or to even say, well, if I get it, I get it. Well, of course, no one wants to get it. No one wants to, if the things that we hear, you know, you can't breathe. It's so hard to go from one room to another room to get up and uh, walk across the room in some cases, or, you know, you're unconscious, you're on a ventilator. No one wants to experience that. And it's cavalier about that kind of a thing. So I think that to, to speak those words is really says something to a fear of how great it is. And I'm no different. I'm not trying to say, you know, them and me, I'm no different. I just think it's, um, just the magnitude of it is amazing to me. Agreed. Yeah. And I just, it's, I mean, I see clients. um, So kind of like you being a journalist, I get to experience a lot of people's different perspectives, which has been when there's something huge like this that we're all experiencing together. Mm -hmm. um, It's just fascinating to me. And like seeing the whole continuum of having some clients who are very faith-based who think, wearing a mask is fear-based and like not trusting God. So they don't do that to people who are like, you got to be wise and discerning and stay at home and not see anyone. And then some of my like new age friends who think we've entered the fifth dimension and we don't need to wear masks. So it's fascinating to me, like how we justify our behaviors and beliefs and how we see it. I don't know. It's just, it's been really interesting to watch my own reactions and then just hear the wide spectrum of how we're all processing this. Yeah. And you know, with that, I'm fascinated in that same vein, how we can all experience it differently. Like I was just saying, someone can lose their life. And then we have, you know, someone who's totally asymptomatic and everything in between. Yeah. And it's all over the place. And I mean, something that's been really grounding for me, you know, we met through Course in Miracles. Yeah. This whole idea that perception makes projection. We are creating this reality we see, and this is our dream world. And it's like our little movie, right? Right. Um, Which I mean, in times like this, where life and death, all these very serious things are on the line, it's hard to remember, I'm just dreaming, and this stuff isn't real, and the body isn't real. And I've just been so aware of my own ego and my tendency to judge or the Course in Miracles calls them attack thoughts. Uh When people aren't doing what I perceive as what they should be doing, you know, (laughs) that's why I love working with my clients because it's like I get this whole broad spectrum and I just I really understand how and why people do what they do because I understand their belief systems better because I'm able to ask them about it. Mm-hmm. I think understanding helps me have more compassion and less right. judgment. Like when you right. hear someone's story, it's so much harder just to dismiss them or judge them because you're like, oh, I see why they feel this way. And I feel why right. they're this way. Right. And sometimes we've had those experiences. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so um, with your mom, I know it's so life altering because, you know, I lost my mother several years ago. Have you and early on, especially, would you feel her presence with you? 
<laughs> you know, it's so funny you ask that. And it's it's interesting because I lost my father when I was three years old in a really tragic hiking accident. So unfortunately, death has been a big part of my life. I've lost a lot of people close to me. And because my mom had some mental health issues, um, I think any single parent home is intense. But when there's mental health stuff going on, um, I don't know, like my dad, I could feel his presence as a kid. And I would feel when he would come visit and just offer support and guidance. With my mom, she came back pretty quickly, like after she <laughs> passed, like, which I just thought, I don't know how it works on the other side with like mm -hmm. how long you have to be there before you <laughs> come visit, like when you get your wings or whatever. But yeah, she definitely dropped in. And it's just, I don't know. I hope this isn't too intense for No, not at all. Um, so I'm a Scorpio. So like one of my sole tasks is to find peace with death. And I think that's part of why death has kind of stalked me through my life. Death used to cause me a ton of anxiety, like existential terror of death. Um, mm -hmm. And it's interesting with the early death of my dad and just like some other experiences, I've come... And I think my spiritual beliefs have really helped me find more and more peace that it's just like understanding death is a transition, you know, to right. another life form. There's not really death. It's just we go somewhere else. My mom passed. She had 24 hour care with her. And I really wanted to see her dead body before she was taken off. Was that it for the reality of it? Yeah. Like it was just, and I know some people are like really squirrely around death and I used to be too. I don't know. It just felt really important to me um, to see her body. So I was able to say goodbye to her. And the wildest thing was like, I thought I would break down when I saw my mom's body. And I don't know. Dead bodies are kind of weird. Pretty quickly they turn cold and they just yeah. look weird, you know? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, but her face was peaceful and I hadn't seen peace with her for a long time. Just witnessing her and like when I saw her body, I knew she wasn't there anymore. Right. It was like I knew her soul had left. The joy and the peace I found in that moment, she's free, you know? Mm -hmm. I have one other sister that lives here in Atlanta who was also able to go see my mom's body before they took her off. And she had her own experience with it. But I just think, and I love indigenous cultures and uh, how other cultures handle death. And, you know, I think Western society were very intense about just like making death belong to a certain profession. We don't spend a lot of times with dead bodies and the grief. Right, right. We have like a funeral and then it's kind of done. Mm -hmm. Where other societies, like women shave their heads and wear black for a year. And it's just more this like communal mourning process, which it is what it is here. But it just, for me, it was very significant to be able to see her body. And then with that, I felt like that kind of built the bridge for me to be open to her presence. And I was like, oh my God, like she's visiting. Like I just. <laughs> I feel the energy. I'm not like a medium and can hear voices. Right, right, right. Yeah, I had experiences with her and she's great. She's doing amazing. And that's so healing, though, isn't it? Big I time. Mean, yeah, that is so healing. I know I had experiences. I still do with both of my parents. We just sometimes I just feel their presence. And I was saying this the other day, I about two weeks ago, I was just thinking about my mom and how she would dance. She had no rhythm for a black woman. Okay? <laughs> and um, we used to always joke her the way she would dance. And I just started dancing like her. And then I just started talking to her out loud. But I felt her. I felt she could hear me. I felt I was talking to her. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. I think. One of my favorite lines in A Course in Miracles is, if you knew who walked beside you, you would never be afraid. Yeah. And like, I just picture like our past loved ones and our guides and our guardian angels. Like, I think, and I even think we can kind of pick who's on our team a little bit. Like we can ask for help from different entities, yes. even if they're not like our our guides or whatever. And like, I just see that. Like I see, I don't think my mom and dad are with me 24 seven, but I know if I need them, they come and they'll right. come in exactly like you said, like you'll feel their presence. And it's like, yeah, I think who cares? Like if you're talking to them and they're not there, like we're connected <laughs> in the mind. So that's awesome. 
<laughs> so um, how can you talk about um, if you're comfortable with it about being in recovery and the we talk we've mentioned of course the miracles and just how that intertwines for you? Would you speak yeah. to that? A Sure. So, yeah, I grew up in a Christian home, which I'm really grateful for. Um, I think it was very foundational to just forming my character and my experience of God. But um, I am an alcoholic and I've been sober eight years. And right as I was getting sober, um, just my whole paradigm of who God is was shifting Mm -hmm. It was really confusing for me in the beginning because the 12 steps are spiritual, like they're spiritual. It's all about setting you up with a power greater than yourself. And that can relieve the obsession to drink. And I was so confused because I was like, I know who Jesus is. I know who God is. Like, why, why can I not get sober on my own? Right. And when I went to AA and did the steps, I realized that like I had put God in a box very unintentionally, but just some of the religious ideas I had been given growing up that God couldn't get me sober. So I kind of had to go through this dark night of the soul where I totally lost my compass. It's like, I didn't feel connected to God. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I was going to come out on the other side. But like walking through that and having like the container of AA meetings, you know, like people who were connected to God and people who did experience God's presence. You know, I call people in AA God with skin on and it's like they mm -hmm. were that unconditionally loving presence until I could reconnect. You make me want to cry when you <laughs> say that. I mean, just the unconditional love part is amazing. Yeah. And it is, it really, really is. And it's like, it's still magical to me how it works, how a bunch of alcoholics in a room just talking about their drinking and how they found God, like somehow it works. And like, it's yeah. very experiential. I think that was the big shift for me in AA. Like I, I love theology. I love philosophy. I thought about going to seminary, but those are all ideas, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And AA gave me a chance to experience God's grace and like to experience God's love. So like, I don't, if I had a talk with someone about whether God exists or not, it's not a rational like discussion anymore. Cause I don't think you can believe in God or not believe in God just logically. Yeah. I think agnosticism is like very real. Um, if you're just coming from logic, but if you oh, come well, from, that a second, cause I don't quite understand. You don't think you can, believe or not believe logically. Yeah. If you're just using your mind and rationality, like the whole science thing, like uh -huh. I think it's a question mark. Like I don't think you can get to a belief in God purely through linear logic. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Like I yeah. don't think science can prove or disprove God, right. which mm -hmm. some people might disagree with that. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, it's like I've had these experiences with God and no one yeah. can disprove that to me, you know? It's like yeah. Carl Jung is one of my teachers. Um, I study his psychology. And at the end of his life, in the famous BBC interview, they asked him, do you believe in God? And he said, I don't believe in God. I know. Yes. I know. And I feel yeah. like that's the bridge for me. It's like these experiential encounters with God. It's like, no one can convince me out of it because I've had these experiences. Yeah, that's the that's and we're going to get to that in a second. But that's um, to me, the thing, you know, the the truth to me of everyone on this planet, regardless of what our walk in faith is, there's a knowing that we can get to within ourselves that you know, you don't have to listen to me to tell you that God is, you know, that God exists. You'll know inside, period. Yes, yeah. in a big book, they say, and every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God, which I love. Like I do, I think I, what you said, I totally agree with. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's amazing too, and really powerful when you mentioned going through the dark night of the soul, I think when people, at least me, when I thought of that for a second, I was going to ask you, and then you said it, were you in recovery and you were already in recovery? Because I think people think, 
oh, you're going to go through this dark night. You're going to go through that maybe before recovery mm-hmm. that, that might bring you into recovery. But you were already in recovery and you experienced this. That's pretty right. powerful to me. And it wasn't my only one, you know, I think, and I, I'd be curious to hear your experience on this. Like when you get on the spiritual path and like, I love the way the course talks about the ego and just, it's basically this thought of separation from God. I find that when I'm about to have spiritual breakthroughs, I kind of have that feeling of losing my anchor again. It's never felt as dark as that first time back in 2012 when I got sober. I think that was the darkest time because it it was just a whole shift. And now I have that experience like, okay, it got dark, but then the light came back on. So Mm -hmm. it's like, I do have times where I don't feel God's presence and I don't feel connected and I can just feel my ego attacking me and like judging me and anxiety. It's like all the neurosis, but it's like, now I almost take those times as I'm like, Oh, okay. Like I'm about to have a spiritual breakthrough and my ego's fighting for its life. Like I just see it differently now. Yes. Yes. And I needed to hear that (laughs) because I do, I, I beat myself up about steps backwards. And I know that in the past, it's been before a breakthrough, you know, maybe for lack of a better word for me, it's been a step backwards and then I really get to where I want to go. But the step backwards, those steps backwards, I beat myself up. I mean, I can tell myself be gentle and, but I do, uh, I have thought about my ego is fighting. You know, my ego's fighting. I know something. And my ego, it's totally against my my ego system. And also, the majority of the day, the majority of the time, I'm in an egoic space <laughs> through work, through worries, you know, re, you know, bills or whatever, you know, might come up in life. Yeah, absolutely. I totally relate to that. So we have a paragraph in A Course in Miracles. Again, before I get to that, how would you describe A Course in Miracles for you? Because I think what's so powerful about it is it's all, it is one truth, I think, but we could come to it from different perspectives or it can land on us in different ways. Uh, So how would you describe A Course in Miracles? That's a good question. Um, (laughs) You know, for me, I'm a stories person. Like I love hearing people's stories. And to me, the story of A Course in Miracles is pretty wild. You know, this whole idea that Helen Shookman, this psychology professor, um, had Jesus come to her and she started hearing Jesus' voice and said, write this down. And she thought she was going crazy, but she did it. And her colleague kind of helped her write this all down. So it's a channeled work and it's a thought system. And to me, I find it, It's And I know we relate on this. It's like I grew up in the church and I've always loved Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But I just felt like all these Western things had been put on him, like Jesus being anti-abortion, Jesus being right and Jesus being like these things where I'm like, I don't know if that's really Jesus. Like like an American Jesus. Right, right. And like, to me, A Course in Miracles has opened up more of the essence of Jesus. I don't think A Course in Miracles is perfect. To me, it's an Jesus is the connection to God. And A Course in Miracles, Jesus is very clear. Like, I am not special. Do not make me special. We are the same. Like, you have that Christ consciousness inside of you. So... To me, it's like the whole thought system of this ego being our separate, this idea that there's only one problem, and it's the idea of separation from God. And like all the little ways that our ego tells us that, I don't know, the Course says like five things over and over again. Like it's a very complex (laughs) text. It's been called a spirituality for the intellectual, um, (laughs) which makes me laugh, but yeah, it's like, it's pretty dense material, but I guess because I enjoy mazes, I don't know if I enjoy reading it. <laughs> and it's pretty, um, it's not outrageous, but that's the word that's coming to my mind that I think that uh, just what you just said is an outrageous thought from what we're taught. 
And I think it took me a while because I grew up and do love Jesus so much. It took me a while to think of Jesus as the same as me. But that's the love, you know, that's the love of it, that that's how much God loves us. That's how perfect we are. But it's such an outrageous concept. <laughs> yes, I love that word. I yeah. love it. it is. It's scandalous. And like this <laughs> time of year, it's just like the idea of like Christ becoming incarnate. Like it's ridiculous. Like, it what? Is. like I just I love I love um, the Christmas story. And I do think it's just there's so much power in it. And I think it brings so much dignity to the human experience of being in these bodies. While we're not these bodies, it's like these are our vehicles to experience God's love and God's grace and to grow. Right, right, right. I had um, an epiphany, I think the other day, I think I was listening to Wayne Dyer. And uh, he was saying something about the body. And I just had a sense of back to we are not our bodies. And but how we think we are our bodies, and how our body is really innocent. You know, if I think about my body and what I do to it, you know, the food I put into my body sometimes, our body's really innocent. And, you know, the things that we do to it, thinking it's ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, can, it can be not good. Mm -hmm. Not good. But if I looked at my body the way I might look at another person, if I love my body in the right way, then I might take care of my body the way I might take care of another person person. Does that make sense? Mm, I love that. Yeah. yeah. I think it's beautiful because I think it's like you can go from either side of the extreme where the Course in Miracle just says there's only one sign and we all separated and gotten these bodies just to like confuse us even more about where we came from. Yeah. And I think you can like make the mistake of demonizing the body and being like, and that's kind of what I grew up in with the church and the flesh is sinful and like don't mm -hmm. have the body and like some of that stuff where I've moved into some more Eastern practices like yoga, like spirit, it can become this beautiful communication instrument. And like, that's what a course in miracle says. Like if you set it up as a channel, you can get really good information from your body, yeah. from spirit. Right. So it's like yeah. the whole idea, it's like, I love, I mean, the Course says we have to forgive everything. So like what I heard you just say is like a way of forgiving the body and just being like, hey, can we love ourselves, you know, yes. out of this? Yes, yes. And so that's such a great segue to Lesson 169 in A Course in Miracles, By Grace I Live, By Grace I Am Released. And there's a paragraph I have been so wanting to talk to you about. Uh, in this lesson. Would you like to read it? Sure. I'd be happy to. I'm going to read the first sentence because I really like that sentence too. Okay. Then we'll jump to paragraph five. Okay. It says, grace is an aspect of the love of God, which is most like the state prevailing in the unity of truth. I just love the course's yeah. language around this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is paragraph five. Oneness is simply the idea God is. And in his being, he encompasses all things. No mind holds anything but him. We say God is, and then we cease to speak. For in that knowledge, words are meaningless. There are no lips to speak them, and no part of mind sufficiently distant, distinct, to feel that it is now aware of something not itself. It has united with its source. And like its source itself, it merely is. That's so powerful. And you, uh, I've read this lesson so many times. Yeah. And one day you uh, just highlighted this line. We say God is and then we cease to speak. For in that knowledge, words are meaningless. What does that say to you? What does that mean to you? Golly, I'm just like laughing at the irony of trying to put this into words right like 
Right. It's just like, it's beyond words. Like I just, and I love that paragraph. That's one of my favorite paragraphs to read before going into meditation. Cause I just feel like it takes you more and more to that place beyond words, which words are great. I'm a writer, you know, I love music and poetry. Like I think they're fun to play with, but I think the true essence of something, it is beyond words. Like it's beyond rationality and it's an experience of God's presence, right? And that experience of oneness, that place, that non-duality place where God is, I don't know, there's no me, there's no voice, like there's just oneness and there's just peace and there's love. And I don't know, it's just, it's so hard. Like I have pictures, I have pictures in my mind of like light, you know, but it's so, I don't know, I feel like it's impossible to put words around and it's fun to try. Yes, and I do, I take it as a state of being. Meditation, when I was first starting to meditate, And I still do it actually is for me to repeat the prayer of the rosary. So basically I say Hail Mary. I don't, I might not do all the other aspects of it, but I will plan to say 50 Hail Marys. That prayer is so powerful for me. And if I, sometimes if there's just something on my heart, I'll start to say the prayer and I'll just start crying because it's so, you know, I just feel such a connection to Mary. Yeah. And what I used to do was I would start saying it out loud. So I'd start speaking it out loud. And then maybe when I start getting to around 15, you know, I've said it for maybe the 15th time, I'm not saying it as loudly. And the more I say it, the more I might go into a whisper. And mm-hmm. then I'm just saying it in my thoughts. And eventually I never get to 50. Mm-hmm. I never get to 50. And eventually, I'm not speaking anymore. And then my thoughts stop. I eventually come to God. I come to a feeling of God and there are no words. I'm not asking for anything anymore. I'm just listening and being and just receiving. It's just just nothing. Mm -hmm. Because I even go, even what I just said, you know, I feel we move beyond that to no thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, Um, it's so beautifully expressed. Yeah. I often think about how this book says we don't know our real thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, (laughs) that feels so real. And like (laughs) one one of the meditations I've been doing for the past year, transcendental meditation, which is mantra based. So kind of like the Hail Mary, but like just using like a phrase or sound Uh to take you deeper but they describe the mind being like the ocean and how the top of the ocean has all those waves and all that action and all that activity. And as you get deeper, you know, when you get down deeper and deeper in the ocean, it's silent, right? Mm -hmm. There's stillness. Like you don't feel all the ruckus, you know, on top. And I know for me, like I meditate every day and it's like, sometimes in meditation, all I hear is the ruckus, you know, but it's like, and that's okay. Like I used to like judge myself on how many thoughts I had during a meditation. And now I just have so much more acceptance for just creating space to be still for five minutes a day. And that's, I mean, for me, it doesn't take more than that. Like I used to meditate for 20 minutes or an hour twice a day, which is awesome when I have time. But I just think, just reconnecting, like finding that conscious contact with God and that being the intention. It's like, even if it's just a lot of thoughts, your mind's clearing that and you're doing that with God still, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just feel like I've gotten less judgy with my own meditation process, (laughs) but I love the moments where you experience no thought and just that deep stillness and peace. Mm hmm. And then when you come out of that, if you spend five minutes a day doing that, can you speak to the peace that that brings you for the rest of the day? Yes. Yeah. Like, I just feel like it gives me margin, right? Like, when people are driving crazy in Atlanta or at the grocery store when someone cuts in front of me, because I have a little space. I don't react, you know, I just can kind of notice and observe. I'm like, oh, okay, like that person must be having a tough day. You know, it's like, I don't have to like go there where if I don't meditate, it's like, I'm more reactive. 
So I just think it brings me back to the stillness and the silence and allows me to be more of an observer, like to remember, like I'm the dreamer of the dream. I'm not actually this figure in the dream that thinks I'm here, like with this life, you know, it's like right. no, I'm actually really joined with God in heaven right now, you know? Oh gosh. And I love how you say it gives you margin. Ah, uh, yes. Love that. I mean, a lot of things give me margin, but I definitely think meditation's the biggest one. Mm-hmm. Just finding that stillness. Like, and I do think it's our essence. So when we tap in, like, it's just so nourishing to our souls. It's like sleep for our souls, like having rest for our souls. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so there was a meditation that you had in mind. Yes. You want to do that? I would love to do it. Um, so this meditation comes from Course in Miracles. The idea of it comes through A Course in Miracles. And it's actually from the Song of Prayer, which is one of the pamphlets. It's not like in the text. And it's called True Prayer. And it describes true prayer as not having to ask for anything. So usually, like, I mean, I grew up thinking prayer is talking to God, telling him what you want. And in true prayer, you realize that God already knows everything that you need. So it's forgetting everything you think you need and allowing yourself just to be with God. Yeah. So um, I'm going to walk through this little meditation. And if you're driving a car, please don't do this. <laughs> if you're in the kitchen, you know, you can do this later. But if you're able to find a seat and sit down and relax and just close your eyes and just allow yourself to relax. And I'm just going to walk you through a guided visualization. And at the end of it, we're just going to be silent for five minutes and actually join with God. So I'd just like you to visualize a beautiful, pristine white light. And this white light is coming towards you. This light is perfect. It's flawless. It's absolutely beautiful. And it just keeps getting closer and closer to you. And it's warm and soothing and healing. And suddenly this light is everywhere. There's nowhere that this light is not. It's all encompassing and it goes on forever. And just as we're about to disappear into this beautiful warm light, an altar appears before us. And on this altar, We're going to place anything and everything that we think has to happen in this world in order for us to be happy. So all our goals, all our plans, all our relationships, don't think about it too much. Just put it on the altar. And we're not giving these things up physically. We're just giving up our psychological attachment to them by placing them on the altar. These are our gifts to God. And now the altar disappears into God. And then we disappear into God. And just for a moment, we may feel like we've been given something up. But because we're with God in spirit, we realize that we can't give anything up because everything is in God. So now I just want you to join with God with this love that extends forever. Nothing is missing because everything is whole and full and complete. So now we just join with God and extend forever and realize that we are the same as him. And that's how he really created us. He created us in his image, not as something separate from him, but as him. And we're going to just say these words to God silently before we join. Father, I love you. Thank you for creating me to be exactly the same as you. We join with you now.
And when you are ready, you can slowly open your eyes and bring your awareness back to this room where you think you are. Maybe you can more frequently remember where you really are, one with God. That was so beautiful. Really, really, <clears throat> really powerful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, is that in the Song of Prayer? So, yeah, no, it's not. So the Song of Prayer is basically details. Like you don't need to ask God for anything. Gary Renard does a really similar meditation around it, kind of just based off the principles of Song of Prayer. And Gary Renard wrote Disappearance of the Universe, which is actually a really great book for anyone interested in A Course in Miracles, because A Course in Miracles, like I said, is really dense. And he he kind of has his own wild experience of channeling to Ascended Masters. Right. Um, I love his teachings because he really simplifies a course into language we can understand. Mm -hmm. So that meditation is based off something he did. And I'm glad you asked because I want to get proper credit to him. <laughs> Gosh, something that was really profound leading up to the meditation about giving when we give God, you know, place, whatever may be troubling us on the altar of God. And one um, you said that those are gifts to God, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking to, about two things. One in this book, uh, there's a line that says, God asks for your forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And I just, it just is so opposite to what we are taught to think. It's so opposite to what I would, I want to say naturally think, but naturally think egoically. Mm -hmm that these are God's gifts. What does that mean to you? So to me, it's like this whole idea of separation from God. There are just so many levels and it is complex and it's not complex. You right. know? Mm -hmm. So it's like even my dreams, my passions, like writing my dissertation or having a successful business or having a good relationship with my husband. I think those are all Jesus approved things, right? Like I do feel like they <laughs> came from my relationship with God, but they also can get in the way of my relationship with God. So I just think the ego is so tricky. Like it's so tricky. Um, mm -hmm. so I just think I find, I love that too, just placing it all on the altar and just saying, hey, here's my life. You can have it, right? Mm -hmm. And I trust you to give back to me whatever thing I need in the right time in the right place. Like I'm not going to worry and obsess about any of this because I think you got it and everything's unfolding like it should. Right, right. And so tell me what you think about this in a section of A Course in Miracles is the manual for teachers. And within that is development of trust. And in one of those, which I used to really, I want to say hate that section. <laughs> okay. Because it just was so hard. And now I don't hate it at all. I love it. But there's a paragraph that speaks to deciding what we want. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I came to an even greater awareness, I think, through what you just said, because there can be sort of a, um, I think, a conflict in me about, OK, I don't have to ask God what I want. And then it's important to know what I want. You know, and that paragraph says it literally mm -hmm. to decide what you want. And I'm wondering if it's not that we have to ask, but if it's important for us, for our own healing and clarity to know what we want. Mm -hmm. God knows what we want, but we it's a part of knowing ourselves. You know, I, I'm wondering if it's a part of that path mm -hmm. to understanding um, who I really am. Yeah. Holy love, perfect child of God. And when I don't know what I want, then I'm not advancing to that. If that's the, maybe that's lack of better words, but I'm not getting there. Mm -hmm. Is that, do you think that or what are your? No, I definitely, what you're saying is really resonating. And I think it's, uh, it's so hard because it's <laughs> Gary Renard always says is don't make it real. Don't make the dream real. Don't get mm -hmm. too attached to it. 
And to me, it's like this paradox of we need do nothing, right? Like, right, you're right. Like, we're not separate. It's a dream. And I really do believe we're here for a purpose. I believe in karma and past lives. And I do think we each have a purpose and stuff. We have work to do here. Mm -hmm. right? So it's like that paradox. And I do think I love that section on development of trust. And it's so hard because the ego is so um, dualistic, right? It's like, yeah. oh, you can't do nothing and have stuff to do, right? But it's like, <laughs> mm, all truth is paradoxical. So it's do what you feel called to do. And I love true prayer because we're constantly surrendering it to God, right? Mm -hmm. like our ego is always going to be trying to sneak in there and like manipulate it and make it something more about the ego and separation than it is about trusting God. It's both and, right? Which I feel like is so hard to hold <laughs> and like our words, even language is so dualistic. So it's hard to express that in a way that's non-dualistic, but I really resonate with how you expressed it. Well, thank you. <laughs> Before we close, there are healing questions that I like to ask my guests. And so I want to ask you a few of them, if that's okay. Yes. So, and we've gone through this somewhat, but how would you describe that knowing that you have of God? Oh, that's a great question. I feel it in my heart. It's intuitive. Like it's, it's beyond words, but I think, um, it does show up in my body. It's either in my third eye uh -huh. or my heart chakra. Like those are the two places I feel God most strongly. When do you feel his presence most? Hmm. I like that question. I mean, I'm a nature person. So I think when I'm by the ocean or in the mountains or in AA meetings, you know, I really love 12 step meetings. I love meditation. I think recently with the pandemic, it's been funny conversations like this, mm -hmm. connecting with others has been a place I've really experienced God's presence, which has been interesting. I've always connected with God through meditation, but through recent times, I've just really been cherishing friendships where I can really see that um, Christ consciousness and other people. Right. So what do you think God calls you to do for yourself and others through your work? It's interesting because I think I used to have a lot of ideas around that. And recently, I've really just been tapping into the peace and joy I think God wants me to experience. Ram Das is one of my favorite teachers. And I recently got a thing from his like bookstore. And it came with a little card that said, it was a picture of him. And it says, relax and trust the process. <laughs> and I feel like my lesson recently has been relax, trust the process, trust God's timing. I feel like I sometimes take God's stuff very seriously. And it's like square peg round <laughs> hole. Like I think I have to force it. And it's like, nope, that's actually not how spirit works. Like just <laughs> Hold the intention and trust it's going to be done. It's like that perfect blend of that masculine and feminine energy. Right. So I know you have many of these. A time when you had a blessing or a miracle, when you said, God totally did this. I had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the biggest miracle in my life is my sobriety. <laughs> if I couldn't stop drinking and that gift was given to me. But yeah, like what I just said, A uh, Course in Miracles defines a miracle as a shift in perception. Mm -hmm. and I'm in the middle of a PhD program. I'm writing this dissertation and I'm very disciplined, like overly disciplined. Um, mm -hmm. I've really been leaning into this truth of it is all being done. I am participating and I am watching it unfold. Like I do not have to make it happen. I just have to be in the flow and go with mm -hmm. that. I come in and out of that awareness. Right, <laughs> right, right. Very peaceful when I'm not, I'm very anxious, but it's like <laughs> um, just that, yeah, I feel like that's been the biggest miracle. God is doing this work through me. I just need to stay out of the way and trust yeah. the meaning of it. And I don't know if it was your husband who said this, but what's coming to me is I'm being done. Yes. Yeah. 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 That sort of sums up what you just said, right? Yes. Yes. Wow. Are you a healer or a seeker? <laughs> I feel like I'm both. 
I feel like I'm both. I, I think so too. <laughs> it's funny. I have a lot easier time saying I'm a seeker because I've always been like, I read everything. I listen to everything like that is the intellectual curiosity I've had since I was a kid. But this idea of being a healer, owning that in a way that's not egoic, um, mm -hmm. I think I've tried away from that term because it feels like arrogant to call yourself a healer, right? Where I do think the Christ consciousness inside of us is what does the healing, right? Yeah, but I think God wants to work through us. So like, I've been trying to own that more. And I think with that too, this book, Of Course in Miracles, it says that we're all teachers. Mm -hmm. So we are literally healing each other. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, gosh, thank you for doing this. This is awesome. Yeah. Thank I love you, you so, so much. much. I love you so much, too. You're so great. Thank you for joining us. Remember, you can listen to all of our podcasts on traditional podcast platforms. Until next time, let's start healing.